This is Constant Elevation, the show for rising Air Force and community leaders who seek to define the future, learn powerful work and life tactics to tackle any challenge. I'm your host, Gabriel Gabrock Avila. Let's go. What's up, everybody? Gabrock back on the mic once again. It's October. It's October. Generally, my favorite month of the year. Uh, I think it's just there is a it's the changing of the seasons, right? And so sometimes depending where you live, September, it still can be kind of hot, especially if, if you live on the West Coast or Arizona or Vegas like my family does. And then like um, it's also the changing of the yeah, changing of the seasons, changing of just it's entering the holiday seasons, right? And so there's just that long, at least in America anyway, you know, October all the way through Christmas, New Year's. So it's just like awesome holidays you look forward to and just – amongst all of the craziness of 2020 i still want to retain as much as you can you could say your traditions or just your normalcy um, october is that uh, that positive sign for me getting here uh, healthy intact my family and friends all of us uh, for the most part being healthy and, and uh, staying safe amongst all the craziness and uh, i'm very happy where we're at as a family but the spoopy season halloween and everything going on in october is very much my um my bag and so I'm excited <clears throat> to announce that for this, for the month of October, I have a sponsor, a sponsor related, uh, related not only to the spoopy season that spoopy, S-P-O-O-P-Y. That's how my daughter says. She does a spooky season. It's called spoopy seasons. That's what we say in the villa household, um, but also to uh, related to the family. So. The reason why I'm going to say is our sponsor for this episode, as well as the rest of the month of October, is going to be Classic Tales of Fright. Classic Tales of Fright. So this is going to be actually a virtual Halloween series. A lot of us may be thinking, how are we actually going to be doing trick-or-treating? How are we going to support our family, our kids, our neighborhood? Are we going to be, you know, only throwing out candy from the window? Do we just leave, like, a, a bucket full of candy there for trick-or-treating and kids or whoever's going to be out there? How do we get them to be safe? Do we have hand sanitation things? There, there's lots of stuff. I'm not obviously a source for any of that information, but I just know I like doing Halloween stuff. So Classic Tales of Fright, a virtual Halloween series from Davison Entertainment out of Phoenix, Arizona. I said they're part of the family because Daniel is my wife's cousin. And so uh, very, very proud of things that he's done. He's an award-winning <clears throat> excuse me, creator in his own right. But he, he, him and his, his team of creative artists decided to create this new virtual way that you could experience Halloween. And so what you can do is you can go to virtualhalloweenseries.com and you can sign up to for weekly episodes every Saturday where they're going to be releasing spooky tales as far as like, and we're talking about like classic Halloween tales, classic spooky things going on out there. This, so you're not going to be the, the horror gross kind of thing. It's not like a Freddy or a Michael Myers kind of thing. It's not the shock kind of horror. Um, it will be, I want to say family friendly. Sure. Cause there's no like gore or anything like that, but it's going to kind of raise the hair on the back of your neck right it's going to give you a little bit of spooky it's professionally directed professionally created this is not going to be so what you do is you're going to go online every saturday you get to see these classic interpretations of poems and eerie stories and classic tales all professionally done from local theater talent in arizona and so it's a local business trying to do things, trying to make, you know, the best out of what's going on in this world. And I'm very, very proud to have uh, Daniel and his team as the uh, um, the sponsor for this uh, this month. So, again, if you want and here's a cool thing, if you're into trying to figure out how you want to just kind of see have the watch the classic Halloween stuff that you want to do all the movies you want to go do make sure you see that but if you go to virtualhalloweenseries.com you'll get new content every week every Saturday and for the constant elevation uh, audience if you use the promo code elevation at checkout you get 25% off boom 25% off supporting a local business keeping that spoopy season up every single Saturday you get to see some awesome um, uh, local talent out of Phoenix and it's just it's just I like it when he created it and I saw it and I saw a couple things of the pre-production. It looked amazing. So I'm looking forward to it. I already bought mine. So every Saturday I'll be watching that with my family, just kind of taking in some of the spoopiness and seeing how this thing is going to go. So again, uh, classic tales of fright, use the uh, promo code elevation at checkout to get 25% and you will not be sorry that you did. You get to enjoy some sort of different, a different nuance as far as Halloween and some of the spoopy season. So check it out. Okay. All right. So, 
Lots of stuff. Actually, interesting. Very interesting. It's going to be story time. Story time with Uncle Gabe Rock. And part of this, uh, part of the reason why I like having, well, it used to be a blog, but this podcast as well, is I just kind of use this platform to kind of share my stories because as long as you learn something from the stories, could be mistakes on my part, you could disagree with me. And I'm totally fine with that as well. As long as you learn something from every the content that I share, then that I say my mission is accomplished, right? And so definitely had a story that went down. It went down this Tuesday. Okay, so here's here's a scene setter. <clears throat> Every morning where I work at JVXU Doden, we have a morning stand up, daily op stand up in operational headquarters, 730, our three star takes the briefing, right? So she gets her operational update, talking about all the stuff that goes on in cyber. And then she has a follow on. This is also a preparation event for her to get ready to brief uh, the four star going on at eight o'clock, 30 minutes approximately after the morning stand up at 730. So you always have this, you have this tension, right? You have to get your notes, you get the talking points ready for her. You want to make sure that the briefing is good and then you just deliver. And I've been in that place. I've been, I've, I used to be the uh, chief of operations and I gave her that briefing for like, I don't know, six, seven months since, since I was working here. And so it's, it's, it's definitely high pressure, but you want to, because you want to get it done well, you want to do a good job. So anyways, so the ops, ops thing is going on and all of a sudden this list of priority action shows up. I was like, Hey, how did that one thing get on that list? I'm asking the chief of operations. I think, actually, I realized early that she was possibly new because when she was delivering it, she was just basically reading the slides. I was like, ah, nobody, I, nobody likes it when you do that. But I was curious to know if she knew because that should be key information that potentially um, all of everybody should know exactly when this priority action happened. And there was this awkward pause. Then I was like, Hey, so we want to make sure that we know exactly how everything gets on the slide because our J3 wants to be very particular what stuff gets on and then comes off of that slide. So if you don't have the information, we'll talk offline and that's okay. Oh, yes, sir. We'll just talk about it after whatever it is. And so then the, uh, the briefing continues and then it goes on. Briefing concludes and all of a sudden I can hear and I'm like, hey, so did I do the right thing? Should I have asked that question? Because just because uh, the three star was there, like, is that important or not that she's that she's there come to come to know? But yes, it was very important for other people anyway, not necessarily for me. They're like, yeah, so I people were upset. They're like, Gabe, I can't believe you actually asked that question, man. You know, the answer, you know, that we don't know exactly. Like, how do we not know exactly when these things go on the slide? We should know those. It should be in the notes. The chop should always have that information available. Well, if you knew that, why didn't you just ask her like offline or ask ask him somewhere? Uh, don't don't ruin the the morning's stand up because we're trying to get her prepared, and so you just wasted like two minutes of her time. And I'm like, okay, mm, I don't say wasted, but that's that's fine. That's that's what you assume because she didn't tell me that I didn't I didn't get the feedback from the three star. Granted, she's in a different room, and I can't see the context of am I asking a question that's actually upsetting her or is she just silent because she's doing something else? And that's just the the tyranny of distance that happens in telework when we're doing basically all of our meetings uh, via um, Zoom or some sort of like electronic means. And so that idea when it happened or the episode, I was like, well, I, I still think it's a valid statement because like we still have this problem we need to work on. And if I was curious to see, not kidding, I was curious to see if she was going to pick up on this energy and be like, yeah, we actually... How did stuff get on here? Let's go ahead and analyze that and make sure we're doing the right things for the right uh, for the right reasons. And so there was just tension, tension, tension. People were all upset and uh, upset at me because I was I asked a question during the briefing and it just wasn't a straight up delivery of information to her. So then they're giving me the feedback. I'm like, okay. And so and I'm, I'm, could I have made a different decision? Yes, but I'm still not mad about it. I'm like, I'm, I'm still stand by my decision because I wanted to, I wanted to see if she's going to like come off the top rope and be like, yes, let's fix this problem and make sure we always have this process here. So, because that's what my J3 wanted to see as well. And then after that, uh, there was like another peer of mine. He was like, Hey, so do you know what your job is? What's your job? What do you think your job is? And I said, okay, uh, my job is to take care of my people and execute the mission. And he goes wrong. Your job is to keep your boss out of trouble. And I was like, mm, hard disagree, but keep going. And we actually talked for like 40 minutes in a couple of different sessions. But I was like, that is a very much a disagree, but I'll listen to what you need to say. And I did. I paid him respect. He's a, he's a civilian now, but prior Air Force. And I wanted to listen to what his perspective was. I'm not going to immediately just say you're wrong. I felt it very, very odd that he immediately told me I was wrong and felt sought to teach me about a certain moment. But like, I was like, okay, but I, I didn't want to just assume this position where I know better than everybody. Like, okay, I'm just going to sit here and keep on listening. And we talked through it. And so that's what this episode this week, two parts, right? 
what exactly is it about me? Did I make the right choice or not? Right is a strong word. Just my, my analysis of why I'm okay with talking about things in front of leadership. And the second part is, what is my job and hit that, the interaction that we had? So that, that first part, right? The idea of what I came to, what the, the further conversations, like I said, we were talking about 40 minutes, right? He was like, we just don't want to bring stuff up in front of the boss that we know we need to work on. I'm like, why? What are you saying right now? Well, we just want to paint the good story. And I'm like, are you saying you don't want to paint the bad stuff? You only want to show the good stuff. You don't want to show anything real. Why? Well, because, you know, we just want to give her confidence that we know what we're doing. And I'm like, that's what I don't understand what you're saying. And I actually, one of the responses that I told him, I said, so I'm okay with going really fast. I'm okay with going fast and making, maybe if you see it as risk, whatever it is, it's just, I'm okay with calling the baby ugly. I'm okay with just identifying the problem and really focusing on it and, and fixing it. Because if you try and hide it away in the shadows, it's never going to get fixed. And there's this underlying kind of tension, inefficiency that goes on in organizations who, who operate like that. And we are like that because we, I work in a, in a headquarters staff and staff, staff units are completely different than a regular Air Force squadron or any potentially tactical unit in any service. It's just weird. And, and I, I firmly believe I'm not built for it. I'm going to do my best and I'll always take care of my people and do my job. But like there's just this some people are built for it and some people aren't and maybe I'm not. Who knows? But the idea of trying to always put on this this good show, show almost like you're not necessarily imp, uh, um, that you're perfect in operations, but that you are only showing that everything is is peachy keen. And I'm like, that's I think that's weird. I think that's weird to be like it's it sh- we should have the built in confidence to understand that when we talk about it across the aisle, wherever it happens to be, what our problems are and where we need to fix it. At the head of the table, if it just so happens that a three star happened to be there, I actually want to take advantage of that because her opinion is very important. And potentially, if that's going to be a priority for her, that becomes a priority for everybody. And so instead of just playing it safe and just being like, well, we know this is a problem, but we're just going to keep it quiet and we're going to do it. We're going to take like eight weeks or six weeks to get it fixed. How about we bring it up immediately and fix it in like three weeks, like really, really fast? Because once we're pressured, once you get uh, everybody knows, you start uh, getting certain tasks get higher on the um, the the uh, the three stars list. It'll get done really fast because everybody prioritizes that. And I was trying to do that. I was trying to break this entire the bureaucracy, whatever bullshit that goes on as far as trying to get change uh, accomplished in a headquarters staff because it takes too damn long, and I want to wait. And so I mentioned that I was like, hey, so, you know, a couple weeks ago, I was, I was maybe I've been influenced by General Brown. I was like, I just want to go fast. I just want to go fast. I want to go fast. I want to go fast. Is that who's going to suffer from that? From their perspective, they're like, well, we're the ones going to get yelled at and have to cause all this churn. And I'm like, why? You think you're going to have to do that. I'm actually already one fixing the process. And so you don't have to do anything, but you think you're going to have to do that. And so it's just a perception of self-preservation, especially on a staff. I don't understand why that has to be there. Everybody who's in a position, as long as you, this is to me, as far as like your work should be based on your merit, not necessarily what are you able to kind of hide away from here or just make these wheeling, dealing with there. I got, I know a guy and I, and I figured this out. Like that's, I know that's part of the game, but I'm just, I'm, I, I'm not, and maybe that's going to be my ceiling as far as I, I pro- progress in the Air Force. I don't like those things. I, I want to. I want to do the right things because they're the right thing. I don't want to have to worry about other systems, and I want to take care of the people. And I, if I see that our organization is suffering from that, I'm gonna. I'm gonna fight hard. I want to make sure our team is taken care of, and we're not wasting time and cycles doing stuff that's unnecessary. So I'm gonna. I'm gonna bring out the problem up front, and let's go fix it right now. And that. That's potentially that's the wrong way to go. But I just know that in my heart, I can't. I can't look at myself in the mirror and feel okay if I'm not doing those kind of actions because I need that's what my I believe my job is to lead is to take care of my people and execute the mission. And so that weird stuff as far as let's not bring up anything in front of leadership just kind of really caught me off guard and I've been marinating on it for a while and um, it, it's already passed. It happened on Tuesday. This episode is going up on Sunday, but I'm like, I just got to get work done. I can worry about it and stew on it or I just keep on moving forward and just get the work done and I'm choosing the latter. The second part, and I've actually posted this question, I, I kind of did a quick synopsis um, on a several Facebook groups that I'm a part of, just that whole thing of what's your job to take care of my people that execute the mission wrong, your job is to take care of your boss. And so the answer to that question is like any complicated leadership answer, 
it depends. I even said, I, when, I, when I mentioned it, I said, here's my thought. I said I disagreed with the person. I disagreed with that response, and I still do. I disagree with it. I didn't say he's wrong. That's a little bit of a nuance, but like I felt it odd that, and I'm, I, I'm, I'll call it my maturity when he said you're wrong, and then he sought to correct me, and I said, okay, I'll just keep on listening. And he kept on talking and explaining, and I, and, I, and I distinctly sat there and made sure I was listening. I didn't try and come up with a defensive measure or whatever it is because, I, for, to be honest, I didn't feel like getting into a debate with him because I really don't care. Not that I don't care about his opinion. I just don't care. Like, I already, I already said stuff, and I'm going to have to suffer the consequences of whatever happens. But, like, the moment when he started saying, no, your job is to keep your boss out of trouble. And I'm like... No, not the way that you said it. Like my job is actually to take care of people and execute the mission. I can do both. Obviously, this is not a. I posted in the Facebook thing. This is not a binary answer. You, it's not either or. It always is going to be some varying degree of both. But he also he outright said, "No, you're wrong." I was like, "That's okay. That's a very strong position, and I disagree with you." Um, so depending on where you're at, that was some of the common uh, comments. Actually, the most common comment that I got was he's wrong and you're right. He sounds like a dick. And I'm like, no, he's a good dude. I just disagree with him. And then the other piece is it was a thing of, well, it all depends. I mean, like depending on your, on your, if you are taking care of the mission and your people, you are actually keeping your boss out of trouble. I'm like, yes, that's, that's what I think, right? So if my if my boss's priorities and what he wants me to do are embedded in my priorities, by default, I will always keep him out of trouble. Out of trouble just seems like a weird thing to say. And, and I believe it's because we're on a staff. And on a staff, there's this weird like hierarchy. And maybe it's on a joint staff is way more particular. There's this weird hierarchy here to make sure that you, you don't embarrass yourself, that you always present the best foot forward and, and look perfect. And I'm like, you guys are... You guys are going to start causing yourself to have ulcers and crap because that's not achievable. That's not attainable. All, what is attainable is putting your best foot forward, trying to do the best that you can do. Are you going to make mistakes? Sure. Laugh about it, own it, and then move the fuck on. Like, who cares? But, like, there's this thing of, like, well, we need to, we need to make sure that we always – so we, we don't show any dissent in front of the boss. And I'm like, why? Maybe there is dissent. And then we need her to actually break the tie because I'm tired of arguing about this with you and neither of us are in a position to win win the argument. Neither of us are in a position to actually uh, uh, come to the final decision because we're peers. So then we need a third party to come over and break the tie. And I'm okay with that. And I actually have told people, I will own the decision whatever you want, whatever is made, but I want to make sure leadership hears it objectively and understands what are the choices of, between A and B or whatever options that there are. But other people are not ready for that they don't want to just necessarily have that they maybe see it as a confrontation i'm like if you do your homework you have your shit together you shouldn't be afraid you should be able to stand on your own two feet but i bet depending on how much research you've done how much work you've had and how many other people agree with you bet money i'm going to come to this i'm going to that fight prepared because if i'm i'm willing to get to that level where i need to bring in front of leadership i have a it's not just me it's not like a hubris thing where all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I just want to win for the sake of winning. Like, no, there's other people that are echoing. I'm trying to be, there's a, um, <laughs> it, I, I found it very flattering when someone said it, but there is a, um, uh, but I, I, it was kind of cool when they said it. So one of my previous uh, um, senior, NCOs, senior NCOs I used to work with, uh, Senior Master Sergeant Rachel Hammer, she was like, say, hey, sir, you're kind of like the people's champion. I was like, what are you talking about? They're like, she's like, you just kind of, you're, not, you're okay with saying the unpopular opinion, at least for leadership, but it's the popular opinion amongst the masses. And I'm like, I get Okay, I guess, but that's not what I'm supposed to do, right? Because you guys are closest and closest to the to the problem and understand the probably the most optimal way to fix it. And she's like, "Yeah, but you are also at that level where you're amongst the the political things and other influence decisions that that may or may not go with the logical decision goes for a different decision." And you always advocate for us, and so we really appreciate you kind of going for that. And I was like, "Oh, that's cool. I, I never thought saw it like that. I'm just you guys are telling me that this is the best way to do it." I believe in it. Therefore, it's my job to go champion that. And I do it to the best of my ability. And so, and I find those places, right? I find the right battle rhythm events to kind of present my ideas. I, I, I'm very good. I believe anyway, I'm good about presenting my, my arguments and coming up with succinct ways to present my argument and solutions. I never admire problems. I always try to come up with a solution. So other people are not, are not willing to do those, have those conversations. And I am. And I'm okay with that because I want to move fast. I want to constantly elevate the team and make sure that we're doing things for the right reasons. And so this idea of 
it's not mutually exclusive just because I'm trying to take care of my people and the mission doesn't mean I'm going against my boss. I don't know. That was really weird. And I think the reason he was saying that is because we were just trying to make sure we don't air out any dirty laundry in front of leadership. I'm like, that is the dumbest thing ever. Like we, it's a it, bet you she already knows. Our three star knows where the, the, the inefficiencies are. And like, she has other things she's trying to take care of. And she expects us to take care of it. But that doesn't mean don't ever bring it, bring it up in front of her. I just disagreed with that. And I'm continuing to move forward to lead my team. And so definitely some stuff that I've been marinating on for the last couple of days. Um, regardless, though, it, it's I got a job to do. I, I do. I'm very, very proud of the, the team that I'm leading. Um, and I want to make sure I'm doing right. Not only the team directly under my charge, but like the ex- external team as well. Right. On the headquarters staff. Like I see people potentially getting burning, burning the can on both ends. I, I don't want the, I don't want them to do that. I need to find some sense of sanity and be an advocate for what is right and trying to minimize those things. Our, our job is complicated. It's not going to get any less complicated. So let's focus on the things we need to do and have those awkward conversations and just dis, disregard the bureaucracy and all the bullshit of all those things that are unnecessary and just get the job done and start moving forward fast. I want to go fast. I told you, like, I, I think that that airman attitude, I think that uh, General Brown and Chief Bass, they're, they're expecting of us. I, I, I'm adopting that in the joint environment, though. I don't have a lot of airmen necessarily around me. I have more and I'm very happy about that. But I'm trying to I'm OK with being that that different person amongst the staff that carries himself a little bit differently men, mentally and all that kind of stuff. But like, here's the way we need to do it. And I know that I. I I believe that we're doing the right things. I can see it. My leadership knows that as well. And so I be, I'm going to continue to moving in that direction. And so this is, that's never at the expense of my teammates, but I do expect them to keep up with me. I'm not kidding. Like you, you have to keep up with me now. I'm, I'm sorry, not sorry if you're uncomfortable, but I'm not going to burn you. Obviously, I'm not throwing anyone under the bus, but you better keep up with me because this is how fast we need to go. So team again i hope that uh, your this month of october is gonna be an awesome and spoopy one for you again i'm looking forward to the rest of whatever comes on in october i got a lot of cool stuff coming up um again my book uh, no pressure uh but don't mess this up is still available for pre-order um got a couple more sales trickling in so i'm very happy about that and excited to when i can start uh, shipping them out to you guys sometime this month hopefully and and then um, again, uh, thanks to our my, my sponsor this uh, this month this weekend month classic tales of fright a virtual Halloween series. Go to virtualhalloweenseries dot com and enter the promo code elevation and you will get twenty five percent off four episodes of awesome and spooky Halloween visuals. So it's going to be some good stuff. I'm gonna I'm gonna tune in this Saturday and hope you all do. So y'all team, take care of yourselves. Let's have a spooky October. Peace.